morning, everyone. Great to see you all today. Let's all stand together and begin our service in song. But down at the cross, are you thankful for the cross of Jesus this morning? Thank you, Lord. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to His name. cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. For oh, there to my heart was the blood of mine. Glory to his name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin.
so much for singing. Please be seated. Good morning. It's good to have you here. I hope you are having a good weekend. I know we have a little bit of rain. I, according to what I looked at this morning, the sun's supposed to come out this afternoon and maybe have a good evening. But yesterday, oh my goodness, yesterday was a beautiful day. Um, I went outside to take the trash out, ended up washing my cars, and ended up cutting the grass. I just wanted to take the trash out and ended up staying out there for about four or five hours. It was great. So uh, I hope you had a good day. hope you enjoyed your uh, Saturday as well. But, uh, I mean, it sounds like, you know, washing the cars and cutting the grass doesn't sound enjoyable. But, man, I loved every minute of it. Just being outside and being in the sunshine, it was very nice. Uh, a few prayer requests I just want to run by you this morning. Um, Miss Margie McGowan uh, is still recovering from her surgery, but she wanted me to thank you for the cards, phone calls, and, 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 and whatnot that you have sent to her, and she appreciates that very much, so thank you so much for uh, doing that. Also, remember several others who are sick, uh, going through this COVID mess still. Some are just, just sick. Um, we also have several that are recovering from surgeries that they've had in the past week, so remember them as well. Also, I mentioned in a one call, if you got it this morning, Ashley Harris's brother-in-law in the hospital in Raleigh. Um, I, I mentioned on the one call because that's the way I interpreted it, but I was mistaken. But um, he was, he's being taken today to Raleigh to the hospital. So remember him uh, having several uh, problems, uh, stomach and other issues. Just remember him in your prayers as well. Also, Christine Jackson's niece, Heather, she uh, last night was or yesterday was put on a ventilator. Um, she was put into a induced coma, and uh, she has COVID and pneumonia. She's not doing well at all. Uh, she did have her baby. They, they did that by C-section. She delivered the baby. The baby is doing well, and so we're thankful for that. But remember Heather as uh, she tries to get through this uh, illness that she has right now as well. Um, also, Ms. Terry Willard um, messaged me this morning, and her granddaughter, Chloe, was possibly exposed to COVID back around... Uh, Valentine's Day, and so uh, she's been watching her. She has some low-grade fever, wasn't feeling well at first, but she cannot go back to school or go back to church or anywhere until she's been 20, at least 24 hours fever-free, and that just seems like it's not happening. She keeps getting a low-grade fever every day, even though she says she's, she's fine. She feels like she's fine, but she just can't get rid of that fever. So remember uh, Terry Wooler's granddaughter, Chloe, in your prayers as well. Pray for our service this morning. Pray that uh, as we look at the third saying of Jesus from the cross, that uh, we'll, we'll learn something from that that we can use for our life today. Let's pray and ask God to be in our service. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for what you do for us. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for providing for us every day, Lord, even in the ways that we don't even imagine and acknowledge even. And so, God, I pray that you'll be with these requests that were made, Lord. I pray that you'll be with Ashley's brother-in-law as he's en route to the hospital in Raleigh, Lord. I pray that you'll be with the doctors there, help for them to determine what is the cause of the, uh, of the problems that he's having. They'll be able to take care of that. God, I pray for uh, little Chloe as she is trying to get over this fever, Lord, that you will uh, help her to, uh, to break the fever, to get over this. But, God, also for those that are watching her and having to stay home with her, Lord, I pray that you'll be with them as well. God, there's just so many requests that we have. God, I remember Heather, um, God, who's going through a tough time, Lord, that you just had this baby, not even able to enjoy the moment. But God, she's having to go through this disease. God, we're thankful that you have provided for and helped uh, the baby. Uh, but God, I pray that you'll be with uh, Heather and be with the family. God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for providing. God, we ask for your uh, presence in our service this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before we stand to our feet once more, I want to take a moment to share with y'all um, why this song is really special to me, especially this week. God used this song for me uh, this week to remind me of something. Uh, at a time whenever I uh, should have been thankful, uh, one of these days in this week I had a spirit of unthankfulness just in me, around me, inescapably, and I found myself being sharp, quick, mean even and trying to lift myself out of it 
I, I felt that I was stuck in there. I was predisposed to, to be mean and quick and sharp and all those things. And I was very ungrateful and I was very sad with myself where I was and I felt powerless to get out of that. So Jesus reminded me in that time as I was trying to help myself out of that spirit of unthankfulness, Jesus reminded me of what he taught me in the Psalms about how we are to praise God whenever we're in the mountain as well as whenever we're in the valley. And he reminded me of how the psalmist says, I will so much. He says, I will praise, I will trust, I will obey. Despite whatever my surroundings may be, whatever my circumstances, I will follow Jesus. And that determinedness came out as the Holy Spirit led me in the form of song, in singing songs of thanksgiving, despite my unthankful heart, to defy that and say, no, I will be thankful because Jesus loves me. I found myself singing, thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Thank you for saving me from my sin. And I found myself singing this song. And the moment that I uttered these first few words, my heart broke as I pictured the cross and what Jesus did for me there, understanding what he did. How could we ever be unthankful for however bad our circumstances may seem when we put our hearts and minds and eyes on what Jesus did for us? If anyone should have been unthankful, it should have been him. He gladly bore our burden. Let's stand and sing this song together. Maybe that's you. Maybe we you need to defy your emotions and thank Jesus for whatever he brought to your life. That he's going to use it for your good. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Please accept our worship.
Jesus, you are worthy. Thank you so much, God, for the cross. Thank you, Lord, for the price that you paid. That was my price. I deserve death for my sin. But you came and you gave amazing grace. There's no greater love on this earth, no greater love in the universe and what's beyond than your love for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for singing, everyone. Please be seated. All right, all of our uh, jam time kids, first through sixth grade, you guys are dismissed. Go with Brother Daniel and Miss Emily over to the Family Life Center. If you have a Bible and you want to turn there, we're going to be looking at uh, the book of Luke this morning, or I'm sorry, the book of John, John chapter 19. Um, last night, or last week, I don't know why I keep saying the wrong word every so often here. It's going to be a tough day already, I can tell. Last week, um, I began looking at the statements that Jesus made while on the cross. There are seven specific statements that he made, and we're going to try to go through them and last Sunday morning, we looked at his first statement that he made when he said, Father, forgive them. And this was an expression of forgiveness that was given by the perfect son. You see, Jesus, while he was on this cross, there's a couple things that you need to, to remember about this. While Jesus was on this cross, he did not ask for a quick and painless death because he knew the purpose that he had for dying on the cross. He knew why he was there. So he didn't act, ask for it to be quick and painless. He did not, also something that we need to remember, he did not ask God for vengeance on the people who had sentenced him and who had placed him there on the cross. Instead of asking for vengeance against those, he prayed for forgiveness on their behalf. And even in his suffering, we see that Jesus was able to forgive his tormentors and care about their very souls. Do we practice that? Do we do that as well? If Jesus could forgive those who hurt him, we have to remember that he can forgive us of our sins, and that he can also give us the strength so that we can have strength to be able to forgive others when they've hurt us. It can be done. A lot of times we say, oh, I can't, I can't. No, it can be done. We just choose not to many times, but we need to pray for, that we can have that forgiveness that Jesus had. And then last Sunday night, we looked at the second statement that Jesus had. He was talking to the thief on the cross with him, and he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, this was an expression of assurance that was given by the perfect Savior. In one of his final interactions here, Jesus extended eternal life to someone. As he openly forgave others that we saw when he said, Father, forgive them, he was doing that. The thief saw this, and it sparked an internal transformation on this criminal, on this thief. And our Savior did not allow his own suffering, he did not allow his own torment to distract him from the cries of faith from this repentant sinner, this person who was asking Jesus, remember me. Even though Jesus was hurting, even though he was going through some pain, even though he, his, his world was totally changing right then, he didn't ignore this cry for faith from this man. And just as he was not preoccupied to minister to this criminal, we have to remember that he is never too busy for our concerns, no matter how big they are or how small they are. Because a lot of times I know that we will have little problems that will come along and say, I, it's, I don't need to bother God with that. It's not that big of a deal. But listen, Jesus wants to hear, God wants to hear our problems no matter how great or how small they are. Because that's who he is. He cares about our concerns. He's never too busy for our concerns. And then as we saw last week, also last Sunday night, <laughs> paradise awaits the faithful Christian. He called it paradise. Jesus called it paradise. I even mentioned last week that there's some people that think that uh, Beaufort County is paradise. But listen, when we get to heaven, we're going to be like, 
oh my goodness, and we're going to have our fanny packs and our cameras and our little little vent or little half hat things, whatever they're called, visor hats, and we're going to be going around just clicking pictures and be so happy because we're going to be in real paradise when we get to heaven. And listen, today I want to look at the third statement that Jesus made from the cross, and it's found in John chapter 19, and we're going to look at verse 25 through 27. So if you would read that with me, it says, But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Now, G. Campbell Morgan, who was a well-known and highly regarded preacher and Bible teacher in England, and he lived in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, he said that Jesus' first statement from the cross showed Jesus' pity and love for man. But then his second statement from the cross showed his power towards those who believe in him. And at, that, and at this, Jesus' third statement from the cross, G. Campbell Morgan says that this shows his constant provision for those whom upon his love is set. See, this third statement reflects his humanity, the humanity of Jesus. And, and though he was fully God, he was also fully man. And Jesus' concern for Mary here was not just as a Savior, which it was, but it was also as a son, a son looking after his mother. His compassion for his earthly mother reminds us that Jesus cares for our well-being. Jesus cares for our direction in life, even when we don't understand God's plans. When we don't understand what's going around and going on with us in our world, in our families, in our, our community, in our church, when we don't understand all of the different events and all of the things that are happening, Jesus cares for our well-being. He cares for our direction. And as Jesus asked John to care for Mary, he's asking you and I, to care for others on his behalf. That's what we're supposed to do. See, Jesus is dying on the cross. Soon he's going to be dead. But he wants to take care of his mother. And he asked John, take care of this. Right now, Jesus, the Bible tells us, Jesus is preparing a place for us in heaven so that we could go there one day because he's coming back one day to take his church, to take the Christians, the faithful, up to heaven with him. But until that day comes, he is asking you and I, like he asked John, to take care of others. Watch out for them. Do what you can to help them. And this morning what I want to look at is a few reminders about Jesus that we can get from this third statement that he made on the cross. And the first statement is, or the first reminder that I want you to get is this, Jesus and the family. Jesus and the family. In Jesus' dying hour, he speaks of motherhood and of sonship here. Families, we have to understand, are close to God's heart. And actually, families were God's idea in the first place. And we see his plan for families, we see his plan for for how we should live, even all the way back in Genesis chapter 1 through Genesis chapter 3. See, from the beginning, when God created man, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. He knew we shouldn't be alone. So he said, hey, I'm going to create a woman for him, a helpmeet suitable for him, is what the Bible says. And then after he created this family, you know what he tells them? He says, listen, be fruitful and multiply and replenish or fill the earth. Make families. Even after they fell into sin, Adam and Eve, God continued with his plan for families and even spoke prophetically of the salvation that would come through the seed of the woman through their family, and what was going to be happening. Later on, we see, after the flood, 
that God reiterated his plan to Noah and to his sons when he said in Genesis chapter 9, he said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He told that to Adam and Eve, hey, go out there and fill the earth. And now that the world was destroyed in a flood, he tells Noah and his family, he says, listen, go out and replenish the earth. But then we also see how God continued his specific plan for families when he chose Abraham. And he miraculously gave him a son even in Abraham's old age. We see that in Genesis chapter 21, how he gave him this son. And see, it goes on and on and on, all the way down to, we see in Galatians where it says, the fullness of time when he sent forth his son. This whole time, God had been working through families, through families, and now he sends his son to be born of human flesh, to live and to die for the people that God himself had created. I'm going to send my son. I'm going to send my son to you all because I care about you. I care about your families. See, we have to, we have to see and, and get that Jesus chose to be born into an earthly family. He chose to be born into an earthly family. That was the plan, and Jesus said, hey, I will do this. Let's go and do these things. But not only did he choose to be born into an earthly family, but he chose to accept the training and the discipline from an early, earthly family. See, Jesus is coming from heaven. I know he was a baby, and he grew up, and he's man, and he's God, and there's the things that just get in our minds, just go, Poof. But listen, Jesus chose to come and be born of this earthly family. He chose to come and be trained, to be disciplined, to be raised in this earthly family. Because families are important to God. Jesus also taught us that marriage is for life. And he insisted on the sanctity of the home. See, he was having conversation with, with some people in Mark chapter 10. And in Mark chapter 10, verses 4 through 9, it says that they said, these people talking to Jesus said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them in response to them, he said, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. Not because I wanted this to happen, but I allowed this to happen. Because of the hardness of your hearts. And then in verse 6 he says, but from the beginning of creation, he goes back to Genesis. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man should leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And then he finishes that by saying, What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus believed in the sanctity of marriage. He believed in the importance of a family. But we also see that Jesus showed his love for children. And we see that in three different specific spots when he talks in Matthew chapter 18. You see, the disciples came to Jesus. And again, I can imagine this because I played on a lot of teams. I, I, I'm a boy, a guy, and I, I, I think about these things sometimes myself, and it's funny. But, you know, hey, who's the best? Hey, uh, who is the greatest, is what they ask. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's it going to be? Is it me or him? Because you know what? I can run faster than him. I can shoot better than him. I can catch better than him. Who, who's going to be greater when we get to heaven? And Jesus looked at them and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Become like little children. See, Back in this first century, back in this time where they were living, children did not have a lot of rights. Children were not looked at as having any type of importance at all. Kids were seen and not heard. That's what we talk about a lot. We, we, want our kids, we tell our kids when we go somewhere, hey, listen, let them see you but not hear you. Listen, I have said that before. 
But listen, as we, as we look at this, and these kids at this first century, they had no rights. They were not important people. And the disciples are sitting here arguing about who's going to be the most important person in heaven. Like children, kingdom-minded leaders should not be jockeying for position. They shouldn't be looking to have power over someone else or worrying about how others are going to perceive them. That's not what they're called to do. They should serve God by serving others. And he used children as an example. And by welcoming and serving those that society does not value, we welcome and we serve God. And in this case, we serve God by serving children. Children were important to Jesus. We also see in Matthew 18 that Jesus gave them a stern warning about protecting children. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, he says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. I don't think he was holding anything back with that one. As a youth pastor for 17 years, working with children, as a father to two daughters, as a basketball coach for six years at Washington High School, as a PE teacher for a homeschool kids over here at the rec center for six years, I had to watch out what Darren was doing because people were watching me. Kids were watching me. And Jesus gives us a warning. And this wasn't just the youth pastors and Darren. This is to all of you. Whether or not you're married, whether or not you have any children, whether or not your children are old and married and moved out and live out of state, it does not matter. If your behavior leads innocent children astray, Jesus is saying it's better to be tossed in the depth of the sea than to face the judgment of Jesus. Watch what you do. Watch your behavior. I thought about not bringing this up, but I, I'm going to. As free will Baptist, we believe that you should not drink any alcohol at all. That's what we believe. That's in our statement. That's what we believe. That's how we practice. If you've joined the church, if you're a member of this church, you have signed paper or you have, you have agreed to that, hey, we will abstain from the use and the sale of alcoholic beverages. That's what we have. Now, I've had many people argue with me. Well, the Bible does not say thou shalt not drink. You are correct. I will not argue that point. But just this one very verse tells me that I need to watch what I do in my, in my life. I may be able to handle my alcohol. I may be able to drink, you know, a six-pack of beer and not even buzz me. I'd be okay. But there may be someone who's watching me. There may be a child who's watching me in my life, and they see what I'm doing and what I'm allowing. And it causes them to stumble and to fall away from God because of the actions that I have. It's not that, oh, this is horrible. There's a lot of things that we could replace alcohol or beer with. Other things. But listen, Jesus said, if you cause one of them children to stumble, to not believe in me, it would be better for you to have a millstone fastened around your neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Don't do it. Watch your behavior. People are watching you. Children are watching you. You don't know how many times over the years that I've had children talk about actions that you adults are doing because they see you. They're not even related to you, but they go to church with you and you hold some prominent position or you think you do. And they look at you and they see what you're doing. 
That was free. We also see in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus raising the little girl from the dead, which showed his compassion and love for children and for families. See, we see from these examples in Jesus' life and in his actions that Christ belongs in the center of every home. We struggle and we have problems because we do not put Jesus first. We do not allow him to be first in our home, in our families, in our own lives. Psalm chapter 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. We need to make Jesus the center of our homes. A happy home is a home where Christ is truly the head of that home. See, he wants to remove the strife from your home. And he wants to replace that strife with love. But too many times we kick Jesus to the back. And we do not allow him to be up front. Jesus loves the family. The second reminder that we can get from Jesus' statement from the cross is this. Jesus and the faithful few. As we look back at the scene that was unfolding at the cross, we, we see that besides his enemies, the soldiers, those people, uh, Pharisees that were there gathered around, that were making sure he was dead, that were watching him, laughing him, making fun of him, the soldiers that were gambling on his clothes, we see that besides those people that were there, there were only a few others who were there. And, and John describes four women and one man. When Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he addressed the crowd that was there. Judas came in, he kissed him. Jesus said, what you're going to do, go and do it quickly. Peter cuts off Malchus's ear. Jesus heals that. They grab him. They're about to take Jesus away, and Jesus addresses the crowd, and he tells them about, hey, you're only allow, being allowed to do this because God is allowing you to do it. And then after Jesus has spoken and, and, and talked to the crowd, Matthew chapter 26, verse 56, gives us a sad picture of what happened after that. Because it says, then all the disciples left. They left him and fled. Those disciples that were there in the garden, you know, the ones that had fallen asleep, the ones that were supposed to be praying while Jesus was praying, those guys that were there that, that had followed Jesus through all the thick and thin, all of these things they had seen him do, they watched him raise this, this uh, young child back from the, from the dead. They had traveled with him all over the place. And now in his greatest need, it says, listen, all the disciples left him and fled. And so here at the foot of the cross, we see that John has now returned. He returns to Jesus. John's love for Jesus and what Jesus had done for him drew John to return to the Jesus, to Jesus with Jesus' mother, with his aunt, and with two other women. And John is there at the cross, the only one that is recorded to have gone back. Now, this is not my statement, but I read this and I, I thought this was great. But it says, when the going got tough, the faithful became few. But how faithful were the few? Now, when the going got tough, the faithful became few. Can that not be said of Christians today? In 2020 and 2021 now? Can that not be said of us today? When the going gets tough, the faithful become few. Why have churches all over the country gone down in their numbers over the last year? Now, I understand this is a pandemic and we're going through a lot of different things. But listen, when the going gets tough, where are we at? What are we doing? We have to understand that these five faithful followers of Jesus were at a place where it was not easy to be. 
Jesus is surrounded by his enemies all around him. Except for these five people down here. It was not an easy place for them to be. It was probably not comfortable. They could have been fearing for their own life because of what was going on. Yet they were willing to take a stand and say, I will be there with you, Jesus. It was not easy to stand there at the foot of the cross. Sometimes, and here in the future, let me tell you, it's not going to be easy to sit in a pew in church. Where are the faithful? You see, no mother would want to see her son put to death or harmed in any way. But the Bible tells us that it pleased God for Mary to see Jesus hurt. Simeon in Luke chapter 2 described the turmoil that Mary was, was in as someone drawing a sharp sword through her soul. In Luke chapter 2, verses 34 and 35, it says, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. And for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Simeon basically was telling Mary, Mary, these things have to happen. And it's not going to be easy. You're going to feel as if someone is just stabbing you right through the heart. You see, Mary knew that these things must come to pass. She's known it since before Jesus was even born, that these things would come to pass. But I want you to notice something that never really hit me before until I was studying for this today. I want you to notice that Mary is standing at the cross. Yeah, Darren, we read that. No, 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 I want you to understand. Mary is standing. She is not sitting there fainting or throwing some sort of uh, hysterical fit. She's not going crazy because my son, look at what they've done to my son. She's, she's standing there. The Bible declares that St Mary is standing and that Mary is standing firm while her son has just been crucified. She's standing. The grace of God that sustained her in her time of grief can also be there for you and I. She was standing. So many times today, men and women are willing to rally for so many different banners and so many different causes. Yet few are willing to stand at the foot of the cross. They'll jump on and go and do this. But when Jesus is in need, we're nowhere to be found. When God needs us to stand fir firm in our faith today, 2021, where are we? What are we doing? You see, most of the work of Christ throughout the years has been done by the faithful minority. If everyone did their part, if everyone was as faithful as they claim that they are, our world would not be in the condition that it's in today. If we were as faithful as we said we were, with the invention of social media and internet and all these things, it's easy for us to type out something and say something online when nobody can see us or challenge us or say anything to us. And if somebody does challenge us or say something to us, we can always delete their comment. We can unfriend them. It's easy to be bold when nobody's there to watch. But where are we today? You see... Jesus said, he, he's, Jesus is, is with his disciples and he's looking out over the city. And it says as he looked at the crowds and he saw the people that are there, it says that he was moved with compassion. And 
Then he turns around and looks at his faithful few that were with him in that moment. He says, guys, listen. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. Look! But the laborers are few. The laborers are few. The faithful few. Where are we at today? How faithful are we when God needs us to be faithful? The last reminder that we can get from Jesus' statement from the cross is this. Jesus and his faithfulness to us. Because I'm I'm sure that as you were following along here, we, we looked at the first two and we're thinking, that had nothing to do with what Jesus said on the cross. The first one was talking about family. We were talking about how Jesus was taking care of his family. That really didn't say what Jesus said. And then we looked at the second one and we just talked about the people that were there at the cross. It had nothing to do with what he said. Oh, they all did if we pay attention to it. But I want you to see this last point. Because in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, after this third point here, it says, When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. I was reading some stuff uh, this week about that where it says woman some people are offended Jesus didn't say mother he said woman there's one commentary that that said that Jesus said this because he did he knew his mother was already hurting he didn't want to make it any worse by pulling and pointing to the fact that she's his mother so he said woman there was nothing disrespectful about it But as Jesus did this, he said, woman, behold your son. He was obeying his father's commandment that Moses had brought down from the mountaintop. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother. Honor them. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. We see the promise, we have to go back to Exodus, where it says, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the land that the Lord thy God has given thee. Honor, respect your parents, love them. Here we see that children are instructed to obey their parents in the Lord and to honor them. And Jesus always honored his parents. Mary, his mother, Joseph, his stepfather. Honoring parents does not stop when a person is married and moved away from their father's home. It continues until your parents die. You honor them. And even as Jesus was upon the cross, his body was was raked with pain, his life was being given for the salvation of sinners, and even though Jesus was taking care of the most important Important matter in the entire universe at this time, dying for the sins of the world. As he's dying for the sins of the world, in his perfection, he took the time, he took the thought, and the wonderful grace to take care of his widowed mother as he died. This should be a great lesson to each of us, that no matter how busy we get or where we are or what our life's work is we should always we should always we should always honor our parents this will be the one thing that this is this is one thing that we will be judged for we see here that Jesus is also taking care of Mary's emotional needs By sending her away, by John taking her, and he left and went to his home before the darkness came in and before the soldiers came and pierced his side, he was saving her emotionally. It's not something that you need to see, Mom. It's not something that you need to be around as this stuff is fixing to happen. Behold your son, behold your mother, and John took her away to his home. 
Jesus also was caring for, caring for Mary's spiritual needs by dying on the cross for her. He was taking care of her spiritually, for his mother. But you also have to understand that he did that for you and I as well. He died for our spiritual needs. But Jesus also was caring for her temporal needs by having John care and minister to her until she died. I'm not going to be here. John, take care of my mom. John was to be a personal representative for Jesus while Jesus was away, taking care of Jesus' mother. And we, we too, you and I, have been called to be personal representatives for Jesus while he's away. We mentioned this before. While Jesus is in heaven, preparing a place for us, it says in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, it says, That is, in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us, to you and I, the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through you and me, through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Paul is saying here, he's, he's saying, listen, you and I are the ambassadors for Christ. Just like John was an ambassador to his mother, care for her needs, take care of my mother, we, as ambassadors, are to care for those around us. Care for their needs. Entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. That Jesus loves them. They can have forgiveness of sins. If Jesus was eager to care for his mother, how much more eager will he be today to care for those who hear and those who do the word of God? He wants to care for us as well. If Jesus could provide for the needs of his own in, in the moment of his greatest weakness, in the moment of his greatest humiliation, how much more can he provide for your needs in his present wealth that he has of power and of exaltation? Where Jesus is at now, he's not dying on the cross. While he was dying on the cross, he took care of his mother. But now he's in heaven. He has a wealth of power and glory and everything that's there. How much more can he care for us? That's what he wants to do. One of the gifts that Jesus gave to us from the cross was the church. See, a loving, caring, sustaining, encouraging family beyond family. It's a great encouragement to our faith that he illustrates the meaning of the church in the way that he did in this relationship between John and Mary. You see, John, go take care of my mother. Mother, this is now your son. And when we come to church as Christians, you're supposed to be my brother and my sister. You're supposed to pray for me. I'm supposed to pray for you. I'm supposed to be there for you. You're supposed to be there for me. We are a family. We mentioned it many times, our church family. It was illustrated from the cross when Jesus looked and said, Woman, behold thy son. So, we should all take courage in the care and the power and the provision from our Lord to us. We should take encouragement from that. So a couple questions for you this morning. What does this third statement from the cross say to you today? How will you respond to the statement that Jesus made? Will you allow Jesus to be the Lord of your home? To be number one in your home? Will you be faithful to him, even if it means being in the minority? Will you always remain faithful to him? To do what he has asked you to do? And then will you remember 
what Jesus has done for us. Would you stand, head bowed, and eyes closed, and let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, <clears throat> God, we thank you for, for Jesus and for what Jesus has done for us. God, you have instituted the family. You have made the family sacred. God, we should make sure that we place you in the center of our homes, in all that we do. God, my prayer is that we will remain faithful even as it gets tough and hard. God, we will not look for excuses on why we can't, but we'll look for ways to be part of. God, right now we're hurting so bad in our, in our country, in our church, in our community. Because there's not enough people that are willing to stand with you at the foot of the cross. They find reasons why they can't. They don't place their families with you. They don't allow you to be the Lord of their home. God, I, I pray this morning that our response to what you've said will change our homes, will change our lives, will change our response to, to how we live our daily lives for you in everything that we do. God, help us remember <laughs> children are watching. Children are watching us and how we live. What are we teaching them? If you need to come to the altar, you come right now. Pray and talk to God as we sing. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for what you've done for us. God, help for us to leave here as examples and ambassadors for you in all that we do and how we live, how we work, how we treat our family, what we say to our family. God, we represent you. God, we love you. We thank you for what you've done. 
God, thank you for the cross as we sang about earlier. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated just for a minute. I'm going to dismiss you in sections. Thank you again for being here this morning. Thank you for uh, being a part of our service. Uh, be sure to come back tonight. Brother Daniel is going to be, uh, be sharing our evening service, so we're looking forward to having him speak. So please be here to support him. Uh, again, if there's anything we can do for you uh, during the week, anything that you need from us, please let us know. Um, we would love to be able to help you out. Again, thank you for being here. I hope, you, I hope the sun comes out this afternoon. hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you look around outside, we have um, the lettering on the doors is now completed. They've got those all up there, so it looks uh, really good. I'm excited about that, just to have that out there. And uh, then we have some other signs that we placed outside about mask wearing and different things. And so we're just excited to be moving along. We also, this morning, uh, have opened up our nursery again. We have some workers in there that are willing to, uh, to watch babies and young people, young children. So uh, we're excited about doing that slowly and gradually. We're trying to go forward. It seems like a snail's pace. It seems like forever. But uh, we are moving forward. That's good. So I'm excited about that. So uh, just uh, I, I thank you for your patience. I thank you for uh, just working with us. And, and I thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, don't forget that. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss you guys. Thank you. For